assembly line for like cars, right? When that was developed, that started cutting jobs. Now it's even more automated and using robots and all kinds of things, right? So the jobs themselves have changed. We are living in an era where cybersecurity is more critical than ever. With threats evolving at an unprecedented rate and technology becoming increasingly part of our daily lives, it begs the question, what does the future of cybersecurity look like? Joining us today to help answer this question and more is John Good. He's a renowned cybersecurity professional and is known for his commitment to educating and empowering the next generation of cybersecurity experts. John is the CEO of Cyber Training Pros, a career coach, mentor, and a content creator providing invaluable training, tips, and career advice aimed to strengthen our defenses against the ever-evolving cybersecurity threats. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Do you mind, for those who don't aren't familiar with who you are, do you mind give, sharing a bit about yourself and how you got started in the field? Yeah. So for those that don't know who I am, my name is John Good. I create a lot of cybersecurity content on YouTube. That's typically how people find me. I also do things on LinkedIn as well and create courses outside of those platforms on Cyber Training Pro. But uh, during my day job, I work in cybersecurity, doing cloud security and compliance work. But as far as like cybersecurity, I've been in the, the career field for uh, whew, over a decade now. And I didn't start out doing that in my professional life. I actually started out doing things like sales and marketing kind of jobs, completely unrelated. And this was kind of very early on in the cybersecurity kind of boom, I guess you could say, and kind of fell into it as far as like some of the customers I had were really concerned with cybersecurity and just kind of started diving into it, looking into it, got really interested in it. It's always interested in tech and it just seemed to kind of be a good fit. And then things just started to kind of fall in line from there. Nice. And, you know, uh, I kind of want to dive a little bit more into like how you actually got your start. You know, you mentioned you, know, you just kind of fell into it. But what did that like he describe more of what that looked like? When I was looking to uh, really get out of sales and marketing kind of jobs because I didn't want to do those anymore, I wasn't really enjoying those. I had started to hear about cybersecurity, see different um, presentations and things like that on YouTube about it. And again, this was pretty early on. And so I really only knew about the degree path, especially coming from a different area, a non-tech career field. That's the kind of area that people mostly know about. And that's kind of why I looked there first. Didn't know anything about certifications or really anything else other than that. And so I ended up actually going back for a master's degree in cybersecurity and information assurance. And that was a good start as far as getting my, my feet wet, learning more about cybersecurity. And then through that program, I started learning about certifications. You know, one of the books that we had was a prep book for Security Plus. So that kind of, you know, piqued my interest as far as like, what is this? And then I ended up getting an internship during that program. And then after that program, I ended up landing a full-time job directly into cybersecurity. I just went straight into it, didn't have to go through the IT area or help desk or anything like that, and was fortunate in that, in that case. And from there, just kind of started getting more certifications, training, things like that, education, and climbing the ranks. I kind of want to dive into, you know, Cybersecurity really over the last couple of years, I feel, has really evolved. I feel like since the pandemic and a lot of things got pushed into like the cloud and there's just a mad rush to digify really everything. And I think a lot of people kind of overlooked the cybersecurity aspect. Like, but what is, you know, the consequences of just throwing everything in digitally, you know, um, into the cloud and stuff, you know, and I'm curious, what do you think the future of cybersecurity looks like in this ever evolving landscape? Yeah, you know, as somebody who has been in it kind of from the beginning of this boom, you know, it's been a very interesting time. It's been a very interesting evolution seeing a lot of these things kind of take place and the career field really just, you know, exploding. You know, a lot of that is a result of more and more companies getting hacked and, you know, really just being trying to be more aware of their exposure to risk, really, because that's really what we boil it down to is risk. 
going into the future, kind of as we, we see things, if we look back at kind of how things used to be before, for instance, cloud. Cloud was you know, not a thing 20 years ago, right? Nobody was thinking about cloud. And so a lot of the, the assets, the systems, the servers, all of that stuff we were storing locally in some data center on our, you know, on our site, on premise. And with the evolution of cloud and the growth of that, you know, more and more companies are looking to leverage that because it's just not reasonable anymore to build out a data center that you're barely using as far as its capabilities. And so I think that's where a lot of the appeal is to going to the, the cloud. But then that does introduce some you know, differences or some challenges as far as the applications that we use, the services that we use, maybe the data centers where the data is actually stored. So it, it definitely doesn't really reduce the risk. It kind of changes how we approach the risk or how we look at it. But I see that as being you know, a trend that continues to go, especially with companies that are being receptive to remote workers. You know, I remember before the pandemic, I was interviewing with some companies and relatively large companies, and they were so anti-remote workers. They were like, no, we literally have a policy that says people can't work remote. And I'm like, yeah. what? And, and especially in cybersecurity, you know, there was definitely very specific roles that were always on site. So security operations center jobs, those were always on site jobs. Right. And some of the interviews that I was going through were actually those kinds of jobs. And then the pandemic hit, you know, shortly thereafter. And then all of a sudden companies are a little bit more receptive to remote working and allowing employees to be, you know, traveling and doing all these things. And we just have to kind of shift how we're thinking because now we're thinking about, well, our data is in the cloud. It has to be accessible by employees on the go. And in cybersecurity especially, that's kind of the game we play. We, we are typically behind because things change in technology or how they are adopted, what companies want to do as far as being strategic in their missions. And then as cybersecurity, we have to look at those changes and look at those different technologies. And we have to kind of figure it out and figure out, you know, how is this changing our risk landscape? And how do we implement some of these controls? Do these controls even mean anything anymore? Do we need, you know, a different type of firewall or a different type of technology now? In a lot of cases, it's a reactive a reactive career field, which makes it challenging because we can't predict a lot of the things that are going to happen. And we kind of have to analyze them and uh, figure out new solutions to address those issues. With all this, you know, this new change and stuff, what are some of the current career trends in cybersecurity that you're seeing? And what do you predict will be some of the biggest threats in the next few years? You know, as far as Threats in general and attacks, attackers tend to go for the low-hanging fruit. That's typically always the easiest path, really. And so, you know, by and large, they tend to like to uh, go after the users, go after human weaknesses, things that people are just, you know, they're just going to click a link or something like that. Uh, very, you know, in a lot of cases, unsophisticated kind of attacks. That's definitely, I think, where the trend is going to continue. I don't see that going away anytime soon because even though we try to put in a bunch of security awareness training and those kinds of things, you know, it, it's not going to always solve every problem. There's always going to be some users that are not going to be paying attention. They're busy, whatever. And that's always going to be an issue. As far as like career paths and kind of areas that are, you know, really exploding or the ones to really look for and try to pursue if somebody's like trying to get into this career field, trying to get ahead quick, it, by far it's cloud and GRC, which is governance, risk, and compliance. So kind of the non-technical area, I guess a lot of people would say, even though I, I would argue that, <laughs> but um, those, are, those are definitely the two areas that are just, there's so much opportunity and there's just gonna be more and more going forward. You know, I don't think GRC gets really enough attention because it is truly becoming a really big part of the cybersecurity landscape. Do you mind, you know, just diving into a little bit more of 
what those people are actually doing on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, so governance, risk, and compliance basically at its core is a very much an oversight function. It has three pillars, governance, risk, and compliance, obviously. And basically, you know, every decision that the business does uh, in a GRC sense is based typically on risk and uh, compliance. So we have these compliance frameworks, things like ISO 27001, and HIPAA and PCI GSS and NIST risk management framework and all this stuff. And basically what those are is they're they're frameworks or standards that outline certain controls, certain requirements. Maybe you have this policy type of technology implemented or, you know, an account review process or something, some kind of control we call them. It usually has a required frequency. So it has to be done every year or six months or month or something like that. And so all of those controls and how we implement those, if we implement those, those are all risk-based decisions. So when we look at risk, which is basically something bad happening, right? Like something something's possible to happen and it could actually happen or it does actually happen. Kind of how do we prevent that? How do we minimize that? Those, those kinds of decisions basically, right? And with that being said, since it is an oversight function, it kind of oversees all the different areas of cybersecurity. So it will require certain things of a security operations center. You know, a lot of the requirements for security operations centers, penetration testers, those kinds of things come out of GRC functions. So they come out of those GRC requirements, and then they are further kind of implemented based on again, the risk and how that group uh, kind of wants to implement that. But um, I, I think that's the the kind of the simplest term is it's an oversight function of all the security aspects. No, I absolutely. And, you know, question that comes to really in mind is how can individuals and organizations, but especially individuals, be better preparing for these evolving landscapes? Staying kind of focus on the news or, you know, sometimes it's called threat intelligence, especially like in the industry and in the career field, but paying attention to the different types of breaches or hacks that are going on, you know, what what's happening in the news, different articles, you can track all kinds of different feeds as far as different examples or situations going on in the world when a company gets hacked and they kind of do their follow-up kind of report as far as like what happened, like looking at those. Also just being aware in general of the different types of techniques that are out there that attackers might use. Some people will go on the dark web and just you know browse around and look at the different things that are going on in there. That's certainly another another way to go. That's not everybody's cup of tea or you know not everybody wants to do that. But uh, especially because you might see things that you don't want to see. But, uh, but you know, there's so many resources out there that you can uh, really track or follow podcasts. Twitter is really huge in cybersecurity. A lot of people love it. But tracking all those, finding good resources just through YouTube, if people are you know publishing things on YouTube, if they're publishing articles, there's really just so many different resources out there. One of the things that I always tell people is that they should get an RSS reader, though, something like Feedly or, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. But that way you can have a whole bunch of these different websites or different sources and get notified every time there's an update. You got to be careful with how many you put in there, though, because there is a ton. <laughs> like, you will get stuff every single day, a lot of it. It's quickly become overwhelming. You know, and do you have, like, a way that you personally use to try to you know, weed out the noise, you know, because, you know, there is a lot going on and in all honesty, you don't probably need to be up to date on all of it, you know, or at least have just a basic understanding. How do you like determine what's important to be focusing on and what's really not needing of your attention? Yeah. I mean, usually one surefire sign that something's probably important is if it starts showing up in a lot of places. So if you follow a lot of these different feeds and then all of a sudden somebody is talking about log 4j or something right then that's probably a good one to dive into a little bit or at least be a little bit more aware of it you know with cybersecurity in general like you said it's so difficult to track all this stuff because there's so much stuff constantly that i would say as long as you're learning something and you are aware of something 
doesn't matter what it is, like something new or something that's happening, then that's going to make you overall a better professional, right? It's hard a lot of times to pick and choose this stuff, especially when you get outside that stuff that's, you know, everywhere or all, uh, across all the sources. It's very hard to pick and choose. But if you're at least kind of building your library, your your mental library, I guess is a good way to put it, of different stuff that's going on, different attacks, different techniques, you know, maybe that comes in handy at some point, maybe it doesn't, but it's it's going to be really hard to pick and choose ones that um, that may happen, right? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So my next question, I know will kind of vary depending on what, you know, niche and cybersecurity you're focusing on, but in general, what are some of the core skills you believe are essential for a successful career in cybersecurity today? The core skills for me and what I tell people is, there are core skills that do not change. I don't care if you're going to GRC, you're going into pen testing, you're going into SOC, anal- uh, SOC role, doesn't matter. There are core skills that you better have. That's understanding how networks work, understanding the different operating systems, so Linux, Windows. It's generally a good idea to have a little bit of scripting knowledge, whether that's Bash, PowerShell, Python. Those are typically the ones that I recommend just so you're kind of aware how to automate things or read something if it's at a basic level and you know it's put before you. I also tell people to learn cloud. Now, with that being said, right, specific roles are going to go into some of these a little bit deeper than others. But I always tell people to learn those at least to a basic understanding. And so typically like certification wise, like if we were to map these to certifications, I typically would tell people network plus, security plus, Maybe a Linux plus, it's not really necessary, but like at least understand Linux and Windows and then get a cloud certification at least to like the associate level. I would prefer professional level. I think that would be better for you. But if you have kind of that core foundation, then you're going to be good regardless of which role you go to. But all of the roles that are out there that are actual cybersecurity jobs they're going to leverage that information to some extent. You know, as you're mentioning certifications, and you kind of touched this on this earlier, how important is like the formal education, you know, like the going the college route versus certification is self-learning in building that career? Yeah, so <laughs> that's always a, a deep discussion. <laughs> you know, so if we look at in general, right, Education in general is very, very important in this career field, not only initial education, but ongoing education. If you're just getting some education, that's better than none, right? Then we kind of start layering that on because it can become situationally dependent. You know, certain companies certainly are probably going to require degrees or certain hiring managers, HRs, they are going to want degrees. You just can't get around that if that's like a firm requirement. Typically, it's not a firm requirement, but it can be to your benefit if you're going against people that are of similar caliber, right? Because it can help as far as basically uh, ranking candidates for employers. So because they're going to look at your qualifications and stuff, right? I mean, certifications are always generally a good idea. I've had some videos that I've put on my channel just kind of talking about different certifications and, you know, why this over that. And really with certifications and formal education in general, one of the big benefits of formal education, whether it's certifications, degrees, whatever, is that it is structured compared to like if you were just to go out and learn, let's say the objectives on like a security plus certification, you know, that information is not proprietary, right? Like that information, you could go on the internet and Google it, that's fine, but as far as like time and efficiency, and especially like if you're new, you don't know what you don't know. And so it is certainly beneficial to take advantage of that kind of more efficient path. Employers a lot of times will use certifications or education again to kind of rank candidates. And that can certainly be you know, an issue if you don't have any of that stuff and somebody else going against you has a lot of it, right? Like it might not look as good unless you make up for that ground. And I think a lot of times 
people, they, they bash certifications or they bash education and they say, well, it's not worth it. They don't make up that ground, right? Because it's kind of like you have to make up that ground somehow so you still look attractive to an employer if you're not going to get them. You can't just like you know, go to your desk and pout and say, I can't get an interview when you, when you don't like make up that ground, like you don't do that yeah. stuff. You know, it's not to say that a degree or a certification or something is going to necessarily um, completely qualify you to do a job. Right. But as far as like an employer standpoint, you know, an employer need some way to try to determine your like minimum skill level. Right. And I think that's kind of where, where people, they kind of argue about certifications, right? Cause they don't necessarily always understand like how that fits into the equation employer. They got to have a way to, you know, again, determine your minimum level of proficiency. And then the people that are kind of anti-certification, they, you know, they, they say this certification isn't going to, isn't going to qualify me to do this job. And they just kind of completely discard it um, and ignore some of those other aspects of how all this stuff works together. I want your opinion on this one. Say I'm applying for a job. I'm fairly new into the cybersecurity field and the job is listing a certain certification that I do not have or a degree requirement that I don't have. Should I still bother applying for that job, you think? It's definitely situationally dependent, right? Um, A lot of times, you know, one of the questions that I would have if somebody asked me that is how close are you to the cumulative job posting? Like how you're matching skills, right? Are you 70%? Are you like 10%, right? Because that number or that, that correlation, I guess, is much more important than the specific bullets, right? Because if you meet, you know, nearly all of that job posting, you're probably going to get a call unless there's a specific reason why not, right? Like in like the Department of Defense here in the US, you know, they have the DOD 8570, 8140, whatever they want to call it today. But they have this mandate where it's like you have to have these certifications and a lot of employers aren't going to hire people that don't have them, even though sometimes they have this like uh, ramp up period where they could allow you to. But that's a huge risk for them if they bring somebody on that doesn't get certified. And I would say that if you are at least um, I'm probably going to get hate for this. If you're probably <laughs> at least like 40% matching the job, I, I would say go ahead and apply, you know, no problem. At 40% of, uh, of the job qualifications, you might not get a call, right? Like you have to realistically expect that's probably not going to happen unless they don't have a ton of people applying to it. But I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to get a rejection email, whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Or maybe you won't get one. I don't know. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) but, and then kind of as you start going up from there, then you should start to get more and more calls as long as you match. Most of the requirements that are in job postings aren't always like firm requirements. Like an employer puts out a job posting and they don't say, I want this candidate to have all of these things. They don't say that because then they're going to have to pay up, right? Like they're going to have to pay a lot to get somebody that completely matches these qualifications. They typically want somebody that, and this kind of like translates to um, like pay scales and job levels, salary grades, but typically an employer is going to pay somebody in the 50% range, 40%, 50% range of that salary scale because it's in their best interest to bring in somebody that can develop in that role instead of bringing somebody in at the high end of that pay scale where they give somebody very small incremental raises that aren't going to motivate that person. That person's just going to leave anyways. They want somebody who's going to have room to grow so that they can develop more skills. They can learn things that they don't learn. They can feel valued and all these things that can give them bigger raises, like all those things. And that's kind of, you know, it doesn't get talked about in cybersecurity a lot, uh, at least as far as like training people, because it's it's an HR centric kind of thing. HR is typically the one that's setting up the pay scales and, you know, 
doing these different things a lot of times along with like finance and stuff but it's kind of like next level knowledge that i always try to give people like that that next level knowledge like the psychology of things or you know why things are the way that they are because it doesn't always like if i if you didn't know that employers try to bring in people around the 50% mark of the salary range and you think that people are you know your qualifications match job posting and they're just not calling you then you're going to be confused because you're not going to understand how all that works but the second that you start understanding more of that and kind of the non cybersecurity but career aspects of things uh, the more things start to make sense and the more you can strategize you know with how you format your resume the things you say in it the things you do the qualifications you go for all that stuff it becomes a lot more streamlined and easier to kind of plan things out absolutely so you i'm sure you've probably been asked this question because i know i've been asked it so many times but how do emerging technologies like ai blockchain and iot impact the cybersecurity landscape those are always interesting right <laughs> and uh, kind of like what i what i said going back earlier in the interview is that in cybersecurity a lot of what we do is very reactive right like if something is the latest and greatest thing a lot of times we aren't going to put a ton of effort or a ton of resources into the cybersecurity aspects of it because we don't know that it's worth that that time or that investment yet with that being said you know certainly as technologies start to be adopted more and they become mainstream if your company starts to make products that use uh, blockchain or ai or any of those kinds of things then yeah i mean you're certainly going to be more interested in those and it's kind of like what i was saying about risk you know it's new risk you have to now understand how that operates or how that works. What does it communicate? What kind of data does it store? And regulations and laws kind of come along with that too, because those those kind of help us initiate a lot of these security discussions when they exist, because it's like, hey, you can get this big old fine, or we can secure this technology. Absolutely. Do you think AI is going to start taking jobs in cybersecurity, though? I don't think so. I mean, really, you know, and I've seen this in even when I was working in sales and marketing and, you know, cybersecurity now, our jobs as tech professionals, and I'm a firm believer of this, is to automate things, is to make things more efficient. Like, that is our core job. So, realistically, you're probably always, like, putting yourself out of the job in some way, <laughs> right? But it's going to shift or change how we do jobs, right? 30 years ago, when, uh, or I don't know when the assembly line came out. Was that 40 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe more? I don't know, yeah. right? But like the assembly line for like cars, right? When that was developed, you know, that started cutting jobs. Now it's even more automated and using robots and all kinds of things, right? So the jobs themselves have changed. And so that is, that's a career issue because you have to pay attention and stay focused with how things are changing and understand that evolution comes to really understanding how trends work in the career field and identifying those trends, those changes in technologies. And there's a lot of like reports out there this company has this amount of market share with this technology or whatever, like Gartner and stuff. And, you know, you can look at those and try to make an educated guess or kind of see how those things are evolving. And that will help you. But that's why you have to keep building skills. You have to keep learning new things because what you're doing today, if you're working in cybersecurity or starting in cybersecurity, starting in IT, whatever, what you're doing today is not what you're going to be doing in 15 years if you're still in the career field. And that's Absolutely. just, yeah, it's just a fact. And, you know, the way I've always looked at it is, you know, all these new technologies, whether it's AI, blockchain or whatever, they're, they're a tool, you know, to do your job better. Those who realize it is a tool to make them better are going to really 
excel and adapt to the ever-changing landscape. And those are the people that are, oh, AI is after my job and I'm not going to learn anything new because AI is going to take my job. They're going to be the ones that are going to lose their job to AI because they're not willing to adapt and learn these new skills as the workforce evolves, I feel. so. Yeah, those are the people that are like, no, I don't want to automate that because I'm putting myself out of the job. I'm like, what? Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm I'm always a big fan of automation. You know, I not only do it at work uh, and try to automate tasks so I can be more efficient and focus my attention on the more bigger picture things, but you know, I do it at home. And some of the times the things I learn from automation at home, I'm like, oh, you know what? I got to apply this to work and that way I could be that much better and that much more productive. And I think it's it takes that special kind of mindset to realize that you're you're only helping yourself evolve and increasing your skills and and stuff like that in the field. Yeah, and especially um, like when I was talking about cloud, you know, if you want to work in cloud and you're not learning how to automate things, then you're probably not going to work in cloud because that's <laughs> literally what cloud is. Cloud is very heavily dependent on automation, being able to script things, use you know Terraform, Chef, and all this stuff. It's not a requirement necessarily for all jobs, like in cybersecurity or IT, but certainly if you can do it, or at least do it a little bit, then that will be in your best interest. Absolutely. So I want to touch on some of the most valuable lessons you actually learned throughout your career. Is there anything that really comes to mind that when you were starting out, you wish you would have known that, you know, that you do know now? I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of things. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that people don't always understand, I get a lot of people that come to me and they want like a very specific tailored kind of plan, like a 10-year plan, let's say, right? One of the things that happens in this career field is if you come to me today, I can totally give you a plan, right? Like I can tell you, this is what I would do as of today. Like if you were like, bam, 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 and got, you know, these certifications or these skills, whatever, right? Like I can give you a plan today. In six months, that plan might not be relevant anymore, right? Most likely it's going to be mostly relevant in six months, depending on what it was. But, you know, the further you get out in that process, the more things are going to change. Like I remember when I was first starting, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I have this like 10 year plan and I'm going to do these certifications and I'm going to get like the CCIE and like, you know, I had all this stuff like laid out and I would go through and constantly researching certifications and stuff like all the time. And that plan has changed a lot. <laughs> um, it, it changes because you change jobs, you change what you do in your job, you change companies, you change teams, you change interests, like all of that stuff happens. And the more rigid you are or fixed to a plan, the harder these pivots are going to be. And a lot of times these changes are what end up resulting in these like big career jumps. So for, for instance, like if you were in like GRC right now and then you're like, okay, I'm going to work in cloud and I learn all these skills and I make a jump to cloud. Say, like, okay, well, that can be a huge jump. And that's just an example, right? Something random. But those those changes or taking advantage of different opportunities that come your way are so important. You know, when somebody's trying to get into cybersecurity, let's say, and they're like, well, what kind of jobs should I apply to? Should I apply to IT jobs? Should I apply to help desk jobs? You know, should I go work in fast food or something. I don't know, right? Like, <laughs> what should I do? My response is always, these are a group of types of jobs that you should do. So like entry level IT jobs and help desk jobs and cybersecurity jobs. And they're like, well, I want to work in cybersecurity though. Why would I apply to all these jobs? Because you don't know who's going to call you. You don't know what door is going to open. Neither do I. And so I'm giving you options that you should pursue and then see what happens and then we can pivot from there. It's all about pivoting in this career field because you're, it's like if we're looking at like a path, like a walking path, it's like you're going to have all these like twists and turns and it's not going to be this like, you know, drag strip of your career where you just like, you know, go in this straight line. That just doesn't happen. You're going to 
maybe go to this job, you're going to go to this company, go to this team, learn this skill set, something. But it's about, you know, in a lot of cases, kind of knowing your end goal, like what is my like, you know, major objective, like kind of broad, right? Like stepped back, like a 10,000 foot view. And then what do I need do, to do today to get there? It's like, okay, this happens. Okay, so I'm in this job now or this position now. Now what do I need to do? What kind of skills do I need to do so that I can make more progress and keep going towards that goal? That is one thing that, you know, especially new people, but people that have been in the career field for a little bit too, but especially new people, uh, that is one thing that they just, they don't always understand. And it's it's something I have to reinforce (laughs) because- It, it is how it is, right? Like if you were to interview people or talk to people about their career path, they're going to have all kinds of different stories about how they got somewhere because they found out how to pivot and leverage whatever they just did to get uh, to where they want to go or make progress to there and keep moving. And, you know, I, I feel there's some people in this field that are trying to get into this field that just don't want to hear that. They want to just like, I want to be in cybersecurity. I'm not going to do my time with the help desk. And, you know, I feel like the help desk is almost a rite of passage. I knew when I got into the field that, you know, I had no experience, definitely didn't go the college route. I was a college dropout. I didn't have any certifications. So I knew I needed to start somewhere. I need to build that experience because that experience is really keen. And so I knew I had to get a help desk job. And I knew I was going to do it for a year or two. And after that, I was going to have enough experience to be able to pivot into my next level role. And luckily, so I did two years as an IT support specialist. So it was my first job. And I was able to, during that job, not only go from just the basic help desk, but really advanced into like a network engineering role within that company. So by the time I was able, I was ready to pivot to that next position was a lot larger of a leap than just going from a help desk to that next tier. And, you know, three years into my career, I was able to pivot into a director level role of network operations. So it's kind of knowing that you got to start somewhere. You know, you can't just jump into your dream job. There's people that do it. Don't get me wrong. There's people out there that are able to just advance into that high level job, but it's pretty rare. It takes a lot of work, a lot of patience, but yeah, you have to start somewhere and start building that experience. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, a trade-off. I've had people that have left comments on my videos saying that they, you know, they're going to spend the next two years studying cybersecurity, just doing that just so they can get into a cybersecurity role. Versus like just going to apply to a job of some sort of IT or help desk or something and trying to get some experience. And, you know, that that experience is important and it is definitely harder to go directly into an area like cybersecurity from nothing than if you have a background in some kind of, you know, technology and also too. It's like as you go up the corporate ladder, so like if you were to jump into a cybersecurity role or like let's just say like you jumped into like a tier three role instead of a tier one role. Well, the expectations on you and that tier three role are significantly more than at that tier one or that entry level job. And so that means your stress level is higher, like your burnout rate is higher. There's going to be all these issues that you aren't seeing that are going to be painful lessons to learn if that happens. Again, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. doesn't mean somebody couldn't theoretically be qualified in some of these cases for a higher level job than like an entry level job. But again, it comes down to who's going to give you an opportunity, who's going to take a, a chance on you, what kind of chance is that going to be, and uh, especially you know today in such a competitive job market, you got to kind of take what you can get and then, again, figure out how to pivot. It's not about waiting forever and not getting experience while you study in your home lab, which is valuable, but it's not the same thing as real world experience. I hate to tell you, it's not. But it is much better to, to get into the workforce, have, some, have a company behind your name or you know, on your resume that shows that you, know, you work there, that you're a credible employee like just get some experience and figure out how to how to pivot it's such a better path 
than waiting around because it doesn't get easier if you're studying a whole bunch and you're not getting experience. Like it's just going to be the same issue. You're just going to have a few more skills or a few more knowledge points. That is some very powerful words of wisdom there. And, you know, as we, as we start to land the plane here, I definitely want to highlight some of the things you're doing for the community. You know, you have your YouTube channel, you are an instructor, you do career coaching, you know, tell us a little bit, you know, a bit more about what you do out there in the community. So I've been creating courses and coaching for basically, well, more than the time I've been on YouTube, though, but uh, so for a while now. And so uh, I, I started Cyber Training Pro, which is kind of, uh, it's not my day job because I have a day job. I work in cybersecurity for everybody that comments on my stuff and says I went to YouTube and don't work in the field, <laughs> work in the field. But I started Cyber Training Pro because, you know, I, I wanted, originally I was hosting courses and doing them a little bit differently. And I wasn't, I wanted a better experience for my students and just better opportunities, better offerings, and a better way to deliver that. So I ended up starting Cyber Training Pro. I launched that uh, in April of last year. And so I've been doing that uh, for almost a year now. I create content on YouTube. A lot of that is, you know, career advice and training and tutorials and all kinds of different stuff on there. It's not as like course-based learning, like a lot of people are probably used to when they go to like a college class. I think that's just YouTube in general, right? Like it's very much like this is a video in a silo and you know, this is a specific subject. And that's why I did Cyber Training Pro because then I can, you know, create courses, I can have quizzes, do all these things. And then I do the career coaching on there as well. Uh, I really enjoy the career coaching. I, I like meeting with people. I like, you know, just having those one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions to go over people's careers and really formulate plans for them on how they can, they can approach things. I do resume reviews. Uh, that's another thing that I really enjoy too. Um, I, I think just over the years, I've just accumulated a lot of knowledge about resumes and specific things on how to make those better. And so I really enjoy that as well. Let's see, what else do I do? <laughs> uh, LinkedIn, I post stuff on there as well. Those are typically more articles, longer posts, things like that, just because it's LinkedIn. I just, I try to create as much content as I can. It's, it's quite challenging. Um, I've been doing YouTube for, let's see, I think about four and a half years now. And like it just... It takes a lot of time. I don't. I don't think people always understand how much time uh, creating a video, like a even just like a ten minute video, really takes. It takes a lot of time to edit. Takes a lot of time to record, and you know, come up with content. And but I, I enjoy it. You know, I, I've had a lot of success uh, so far on YouTube, and hopefully a lot more to come. Absolutely. No, it's it's YouTube is definitely a labor of love. I've been doing YouTube now for about four years. And a good chunk of that was, um, you know, I burnt out several times on it and it's, but I enjoy helping people. I enjoy getting the feedback and hearing that, you know, I've helped people advance their careers or land that first job. Um, that's why keep, it keeps me going, but we'll definitely make sure and leave some links down in the description to all your resources and stuff. So people can go check you out. Yeah. So uh, is, do you have any parting words of wisdom do you like to share as we you know, wrap up this episode? One of the things with cybersecurity right now that I, I see quite a bit is a lot of people are frustrated with trying to get into the career field. And I get it, right? Like it's, I, I see the problems. I see why people are frustrated. And especially as a newer person coming into the career field, you don't always have a lot of the context or just knowledge about how to navigate the career field. And, you know, I look at back when I started, there was not nearly as much no uh, information out there or knowledge out there as there is now. I guess, you know, thanks to all the, the creators that came along and started creating stuff. But, you know, now there's just a ton of information. So it's kind of like the reverse, where it's like, there wasn't any information when I was starting, so I had to figure it out. Now there's all this information, and you kind of have to sort through it. 
And, you know, just make sure that as you get information, you're getting information that is backed really by data, right? Like uh, a lot of information that I give is based on data. Like I'll go to job postings and I'll search for things. And like, I will give you those answers. I won't just make up things, but you know, if you can find information like that, that is more credible, that will be more beneficial to you than sometimes kind of like the flash of some uh, YouTube or like some other content that is out there. And, you know, stay the course. If you do the right things, you, you will get there. But remember, this career field is all about pivoting. So whatever decision you make, make a decision, take a job, take a, take a role, join a company, learn a skill, whatever. Figure out how to take that and leverage that towards your ultimate goal. You'll keep building up skills and knowledge and you'll just keep becoming a better and better professional. That will be a lot better than kind of just you know, throwing up your hands and uh, waiting around, I guess, for, for the best opportunity. Because usually the best opportunity doesn't come along until later. You have to figure out how to get there by pivoting. Such great advice. Um, you've been, you've dropped so much useful knowledge on this episode. I can't thank you enough for coming on and just sharing all your wisdom with us. Yeah. I I appreciate you having me. It's been fun. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this video and until next time, keep learning.